Tone. Interesting conflicts, not conflicts of interest. Typical corporate bullshit. With your hosts, Nate, Robbie, Chris, Nika, and Kelly. FinalEncounterCast.com Ready? Get set? Go! What's up? Welcome to Final EncounterCast. Joining us live here at twitch.tv slash Final EncounterCast. Thanks for uh, joining us. FinalEncounterCast.com is the website. You can also find us on social media, Twitter.com slash FEC Podcast and Facebook.com slash Final EncounterCast. My name's Nate Bender. Thanks for joining me. Joined by my crew, we've got Chris, Kelly, oh, and Nika. Hello. No Robbie today. We, we, we thought we might have him. Right. We but, thought we might have him, but... But no. retail... But no. And co-workers suck. Oh, that's too bad. Apparently a third of his co-workers called in today. Oh, dude. What Sunday. a dick move. The Saturday of Labor Day? Are you kidding me? Sunday. 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 Whatever. I know what day it is. Don't correct me. <laughs> Plot twist. Do There's you, though? Only three workers. No, you don't... <laughs> I... I rewound time is what I did. I'm right. You're wrong. Yeah. Wrong show. It's we the wrong time last It's show. the co-hosts that are wrong. Get owned. <laughs> you stupid dicks. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we uh, we appreciate you having along uh, having you along for the show. Now, uh, something that we talked about a little bit on uh, Limit Break Radio, but that we also want to talk about here is that uh, we are hard at work at a brand new show. We can't tell you a whole lot about it just yet. Because we're dicks. No, it's, well, <laughs> yes, we, we are. are but, but that's not why we're dicks. That's, wh- that's not why we can't talk about it. We can't talk about it because this looks like it's going to be a product for radio like not just a podcast not just a show that's done here on twitch or on youtube uh or anything like that this is going to be distributed through radio stations and it's something that i'm really excited about because this is the culmination of 10 years worth of podcasting and an entire career's worth of work on my part uh you know this is this is the only thing that i've ever really wanted to do uh ever since i was like 16 i've been involved with making radio and trying to do it with with the aspirations of doing it professionally and making my income doing this i love doing this it's maybe the only thing that i do love most everything i can be pretty critical about but this is the one thing that is just such a core part of me and the cool part is is that it's been your support that has got us here and i've got to say thank you guys i've 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 got to say thank you for your support over at patreon.com slash limit break radio that helped us launch this show and this show was the initial demo that got sent around to get people involved with this show Final EncounterCast was essentially the content that we had sent out as as feeler content. And that's what got people interested in us as content creators to make stuff for the radio. So, I mean, it is really entirely because of you guys that we've been put in this position. And we can't thank you enough. This is so huge for us. And uh, we're super excited to uh to 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 finally share it with you guys like we this isn't even just like a concept anymore this is actually like happening you know like pilots have been recorded um you know it's it's so exciting and so new because no one has ever done this on on radio before Uh, i mean maybe they have you know in very small pockets you know like maybe they're they're, you know, uh, a morning show host, and and they'll do a show late night on the weekends about, and they talk about video games and magic cards or RPGing or whatever, you know, like that. Those I know that those shows exist, but a coordinated effort to say, 
hey, a gaming audience, we want you to come to the radio to engage with this show and engage with this product. That's entirely new. That's an entirely different call to action than gamers are used to. And so it comes along with a lot of risk. There's a lot of risk involved in doing this new show. But I don't know what else I would do. This is this is. I, I mean, radio is su it plays such a, a huge part in my life uh, that you know we really felt like our competitive advantage lied in talking to those people that I already knew, who you know not controlled necessarily the purse strings, but controlled the access. They were the gatekeepers for the access to getting on the air. And those are the same people that I've been sending demo tapes to for my entire career saying, hey, put me on the air. Let me spin songs for you. And this is the thing that broke it open. Yeah, of all things. Of all things. And, and the thing is that there are way more factors set against our success than, than factors running for it. You know, like a, a talk show based on video games on the radio is it's such a, it, it, I mean, like, it's such a, like, no one would think to put it on the radio. Everyone has come to me and said, why don't you do this as a podcast? You've been making podcasts. Well, why not just keep doing that? And my answer has been, well, because our audience has been the main drivers of that force. Our audience has been the main economic force of that engine. And... I can't continue to do that. I can't continue to have our listeners bear the brunt of the cost of this show. And so, you know, we've tried to find advertisers. We're not terribly good at it. I'm not <laughs> not going to lie. I'm going to yeah. be completely honest with you. It's oh, not, come on. It's not part of the business that I'm very good at at all. And so we definitely needed some help. And part of that is rounding off some of the edges that maybe this show or Limit Break Radio has and making it as presentable as possible right so that's what we're in the process of doing we're super excited about that and i know that on a previous episode we had mentioned you know like we want to do the pilot live and we want to give our patron donors you know exclusive access to that and we actually got the kibosh on that like the 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 our consultants who you know we had spent time getting to agree to this crazy concept said you know no you really need to protect your brand so wait like let you know let affiliates or or you know uh program managers hear that wait to you know wait to share that not saying the day won't come where you do get to listen to the pilot right but it's a little bit down the line right and and the other thing is is that we borrow a lot of content from final encounter cast you know we've been that there's been a lot of crossover a lot of the discussions that we've had first here on final encounter cast have made a reappearance on this pilot and I, i'm i'm i mean the 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 discussions are obviously great they were great when we had them here and I think refining that process, it, it's going even better. It's great. But we did want to have something to share with you guys. Maybe just a little thing, but this is one of the new segments that we have come up for, we've come up with for this new show. Uh, and being that, you know, we're, we're looking at sports talk radio to be the carrying format for a lot of uh, you know a lot of our affiliates uh we needed to have some way to hook it in with what happens competitively here in the video game world uh and so the enormous groundswell underneath esports seemed like the best opportunity to do that so what we want to do is normally I know we start off with gaming news. We still got the gaming news. Don't worry about that, guys. That is still to come. But we wanted to share with you guys one of our new benchmark segments from our new show, Name Withheld, that, uh, that we're going to be doing each and every single week that you can look forward to. So let's kick it over to Callie at the news desk for an eSports gaming update. Oh, my God! All 
Alrighty guys, starting off in the world of League of Legends, last weekend saw the completion of both the North American and European Summer Splits. In North America, Team Solo Mid emerged victorious with a thrilling 3-1 defeat of Cloud9. The win comes despite them having already punched their ticket to Worlds, but for Cloud9, the loss means they'll have to qualify in the Gauntlet Tournament, which began yesterday. Logic Gaming has also qualified for Worlds based off their overall points for the year, leaving Cloud9, Immortals, Liquid, and Team Envy battling for the remaining spot. Envy and Liquid played yesterday in the first round of the gauntlet with Team Envy winning 3-0 in the best of five. They go up against Cloud9 today and that match is running as I speak. The winner will go on to face Immortals for the final North American World slot tomorrow. And meanwhile in the European scene, G2 Esports and H2K have secured their entry at Worlds with Unicorns of Love, Splice, Fnatic, and and giants battling it out for the last spot. You know what I just watched again? I, I actually got the chance to share this with my parents who have been bugging to watch this movie for a long time, but that uh, that movie, All Work, All Play, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, it, it goes over the entire narrative of the ESL, but also, uh, um, you know, talks a lot about the history between TSM and Cloud9, and yeah. really kind of, like, it, it, it it's, I wouldn't say, like, it's an advertisement uh, for Cloud9 or anything, but Cloud9 is really kind of shown as, like, your hometown hero through that documentary. Kind of. And I sort I just, it reminded me how much I enjoyed it the first time I saw it. And I just wanted to remind people that it's out there. It's on Netflix. It's a really great documentary. If you're new to esports, this is a really great way to kind of like get your head around what exactly is going on in the scene. Cloud9's original formation in uh, LCS was actually very interesting because they just took like the best player at each spot that they could find who didn't have a team and threw them together. Yeah. And that was the team. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Unicorns of Love defeated Giants yesterday and are playing Fnatic today for the right to move on and face off with Splice tomorrow for the final spot. In the world of StarCraft 2, the finals for the 2016 Season 2 GSL have been set with Protoss player SOS set to face off in a best of seven with Terran player Byun. The, uh, that winner will punch their ticket to the global playoffs. Meanwhile, over in the Star League, it'll be a Zerg versus Zerg matchup as Dark and Solar meet up in the finals. As, if, as with the GSL, the winner of this match will be heading to the global playoffs, though it should be noted that Dark has already qualified. If he wins, then the, then the Star League will send another player based on overall performance for the year. The Overwatch Open is down to 16 remaining teams, 8 from each from North America and Europe. The 8 North American teams will begin a double elimination tournament on September 25th, while the European teams will begin on September 28th. The winner of each tournament will square off live on TBS on Friday, September 30th. Dude, this is unprecedented to have that kind of exposure. TBS is a huge network. Absolutely. Huge. I, I mean, that's that's. I think that that's even more notable than ESPN, and I don't think esports has been featured on ESPN Main. It's been on the twos and the threes. Yep, yeah. the ochos. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and I, I I think just having that kind of exposure for esports and for Overwatch is huge. This is a game that isn't even a year old yet. No. TBS has been showing a good bit of uh, like Counter Strike uh, Global Initiative. Have they? Counter Strike Go. I'm sorry, CSGO. Uh, they've been showing a good bit of that over the past few months, but it'll be cool to see Overwatch break through and yeah. uh, make some, make its way on uh, cable. In the world of fighting games, the Game 16 convention in the United Arab Emirates has been cancelled, taking with it the only major ranked Capcom Pro Tour event in the Middle East. Convention organizers say release schedules of certain titles made it impossible for them to provide a quality show. AKA Street Fighter V. Yep, and that they are working with various airlines to refund purchase tickets. It is unclear if the Street Fighter V based event is to be made up in another region. God, how unfortunate, because, I, you know, I really feel like tournaments in that region are pretty rare. You don't get right. you don't get many of them, yeah. and and to to have a situation where it's not you know like it's not like some kind of bizarre travel restriction or awful disaster that prevents a tournament, but it's actually the problematic launch of the software itself that has prevented a competition from moving forward. First of all, that's got to be notable. Second of all. That is so inexcusable to let happen. Yeah. Do you place the blame more on Street Fighter V or on them trying to run this event before the game was available? 
Well, that's the thing is that I'm not really familiar with the kind of promises that Capcom had made surrounding Street Fighter V. Mm. So, you know, knowing that, it, like, I think that would be an important piece of information to have. Like, what was the expectation of the audience? Did they expect all the features of the game by now? And and Capcom just had to put it, uh, you know, push it back? Or has Capcom been making promises that they haven't been delivering on? Like, of course, we've been hearing about No Man's Sky again. Again and again and again, yep. but like that, I and we talked a little bit about this last week. But like, I sort of feel like it's a little bit of part of the expectation now on the gamers' point uh, part to like, oh yeah, there's just going to be some shit that's not that's not ready or not in there, and I. Maybe we just didn't hear about it as much with Capcom. I know that Street Fighter V's release was a disaster, but I mean, this really speaks volumes. Definitely for it. a bummer. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Well, and that's what we got going on in esports this week, guys. So there you go. That's going to be one of our new benchmark segments over on our brand new show called. Yeah. No, nope, not going to tell you. Not going to tell you. Almost. Almost. Uh, but uh, we are excited to be working on that and uh, be moving forward with that and sharing it with you guys in the future. So, um, you know, be sure to, to stay tuned to Final Encountercast and LimitBreakRadio.com for all of the... Uh, you know, all of the uh, news and information surrounding that. And, of course, also our uh, our forthcoming site, lbrnetwork.com. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all stuff to uh, be on the lookout for. Uh, all right. So with that out of the way, let's check out what's going on in gaming news. I'm here <clears throat> to do the news tonight. And that's the way the news goes. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program to bring you important news. Here's a story that's out of this world. All right, here we go. Alrighty, guys, starting off with Konami, they have announced they will be releasing the definitive edition of Metal Gear Solid 5. The game will include the Phantom Pain and Ground Zeroes, as well as the DLC for both games for $49.99. The re-release will be available October 13th and will not touch the much-discussed Mission 41. 51. Wow, what? could I have, blo- like, mush mouth that worse? It's terrible. <laughs> wow. The re-release will be available October 13th and will not touch the much-discussed Mission 51. That is a bit of a tongue twister, I'm not going to lie. That was It doesn't tough. roll off the tongue very well. No. <sighs> when I saw Definitive Edition, I got very excited because I thought maybe on the off chance... They might have caved to the pressure, but really? wait, you got I said I saw that and I thought, <laughs> wow, the balls from Konami to dare call something the definitive edition. <laughs> Especially when the creator of that that product has been drummed out of the company. Yeah, yeah I the think, balls. Yeah, that you know, you got a good point there, but I also kind of expected it. Like I, I expected a combined version that had Ground Zeroes and MGS five in the same package because the original release for MGS5 had day one edition printed on the box you know or you know release edition or whatever mm-hmm. so I'm like there's gonna be another one okay. like you, kn- you knew that there was gonna be another edition of the game that was put out so I, that part doesn't surprise me so I mean I guess it makes me think a little bit more about Kojima's intention leaving episode 51 unfinished right and you know we had talked about this on on the show like if that was his intention and he was trying to deliver on a theme of a phantom pain uh for the players that i mean i think that in some way that this supports this and i really just wish on the one hand i wish he would come out and say one way or another what his intention was with episode 51 and but at the same time i don't because like David Lynch has never explained a single movie that he's ever put out, and he makes my favorite movies. And I feel like a creator explaining the thing that they make and explaining their intention takes away from the possible interpretations of it. It's like when you explain the joke, no one laughs. Yeah, a little bit. I think think that that's probably a fair comparison. Um, So, you know, part of me wants to know, but part of me also is like, yeah, that mystery should be left out there forever. 
I don't know. I, don't know. I'm, I'm I want to know. It, I, I really, I want to know. I'm not surprised by that, Nika. Nika <laughs> wants the joke explained. Well, I, I guess here's what it comes down to. So let's say it's it's like uh, finding out whether or not the kid's a boy or a girl. Someone hands you the folder. Are you looking in it or are you not looking in it? Yeah, the answer's you, there. Do, do you look? Do you have do you have the ability to resist temptation enough to to be okay with not knowing? Nate, like, do you look? I, I, no, I don't. If, 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 if maybe my, falls along with my hopes for I don't know because like that thing is like when I do eventually have kids, I want to like keep it a secret. Then I have a party where I like reveal it to everybody. Okay, right? So like Metal Gear can like keep it a secret, and then they should just like blow it at some big like big grand moment. Uh. <laughs> kind of like the uh, Final Fantasy 15 release date. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like, yeah, it's it's tough. I I I am someone who can resist temptation. I know that because I I have resisted it many times to be able to pursue my idea of what I think is fun. For example, right? I'm playing Pokemon Soul Silver right now. And the reason that I wanted to do that was so that I would have my lineup ready to go for Sun and Moon. Because, shockingly, and I can't believe that I'm about to admit this on the show or say this out loud, but Robbie was right. Oh my god. Uh, oh that, my god, I can't on. believe I said... <laughs> that couldn't have been good. He will never know Do about this a, anyway. If he doesn't listen to yeah, it. Yeah, he doesn't I, listen to the show. I got I to gotta throw up bu- bucket for you. <laughs> uh, he must never know. Look, uh, I'll he, tell him. He was, he was right on, on a couple of accounts. First of all, he was right that Pokemon Go is a smash success. Second, he was right that the driver of, of interest in Pokemon Go was the social aspect and like that moment of like dude i was walking along and i found a gyarados and holy shit you know what i mean like that we've we've shared so many of those stories just among ourselves in our facebook chat that we have as as hosts yeah you know like that's that's commonly like what our stories are at the end of the day like dude i caught 15 kabuto today (laughs) you know what i mean um and and that's your yeah, story. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's commonly my story. That 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 is my story, and it's an awesome story. But not only that, but like you know, there's he was also right that the success of Pokemon Go has at least driven my interest in Sun and Moon. I would have I would have not I wouldn't have said three months ago that I was even going to buy it. I wasn't, even buy sold, it? I wasn't even sold on buying it. I have a pre-ordered, motherfucker. Oh, oh my gosh, you're uh, worse than I am. I know. Oh, after just last what? week talking about how much we hate pre-orders. No, it was because of last week that I went in and pre-ordered it. <laughs> really? Is that sarcasm? No. Uh, 100% truth. You want to know why? Because yes. it's a cart. And I want to be able to play it day one. <sighs> I don't feel good about it. Because you're right. You guys are absolutely right. You don't pre-order it. You walk in to buy it. 50-50 shot that they got a copy. Mm-hmm. I wanted to make sure that my copy was there day one. Because I want to you pre-order, it. of course. Exactly. That's why. So, I mean, like, what a, what a, what a 180 I have done in just three months of pre-Pokemon Go to now post-Pokemon Go. Wow, that's so next gen. <laughs> Yeah, actually. you're a Nintendo fanboy. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's how's that bubble? Yeah, how's that yeah. Bu- bubble feel? <laughs> a little suffocating, is it? <laughs> so, uh, tell us about the the story of uh, borrowing Robbie's Soul Silver cart. Yeah. So, anyway, back to the point about temptation. So, I I, I borrowed uh, Robbie's Soul Silver and uh, his. DS to be able to to um, I really I, initially I had borrowed it to be able to do the evolution uh, transfers right like oh so that's all you did right no oh so you gave in to temptation N- no well uh, <laughs> yes uh, no, uh, uh, let me finish the story <laughs> let me finish the story you lose <laughs> so so when I was looking at his PC box for like all of his his Pokemon that he hadn't taken with him in his living pokedex which i know he's working on uh i found a lot of really good stuff there's a lot of really good stuff there's a mew in there you know like just i mean like i was like oh wow this is really cool so you left those no i took all of them because he, he i asked 
To be fair, well, I asked. No, yeah, yeah. I asked. You didn't steal them. No, I did not steal them. They were willingly given. They were given. He would have okay, stolen them. them. No, I would not have stolen them. That would, I, that would have been shitty. Because it, it took a lot of time to transfer all of those. Yeah. Okay? But in in that collection of Pokemon, everyone knows, everyone knows how much... How much I I love Kabutops. That's that's the only Pokemon that I care about. Oh, right? you like Kabutops? Yeah, I do. I didn't even know that. I do. Huh. That's why I've been spending so much time catching Kabutos over at the Kabuto Nest in uh, Oak Park. You've been walking around? Yeah. Oh. How's that doing to your leg? Uh, actually, my knee is really fucked. <laughs> I've been walking a lot. Like, a lot. Okay. Anyway, my point being, there are two level 40 Kabutops on that Soul Silver and a level 1 Kabuto. But... I had already done my due diligence early in the game because I knew what I was doing, and I knew that I wanted to carry this lineup on with me throughout the rest of the game. I had already, I had already farmed a dome fossil. I have one in my inventory. I've got two in my inventory, and I didn't give in to temptation and take the Kabutops or the Kabuto even for the Dex entries. I said no. I want to raise my own because if I don't, what's the point? What's the point? I'm playing somebody else's Pokemon game. That's not temptation. Sure it is. You already have one. Why do you need another one? No, I have the fossil. I haven't even gotten to, uh, what is it, Viridian? To, Cinnabar to, Island for that, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, is it Cinnabar? Oh, Jesus. I think it's Cinnabar yeah, Island. Yeah, Holy Cinnabar. Christ. You could actually do that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a lot. See, I've got a lot of work and time to put in to it before I even get my level one Kabuto out of the fucking deal. But I want it. I want my name attached, because you can see it on the trainer card. I want my name attached to that motherfucker. Honestly, uh, that, that, that's very real. I did not give in to the temptation of just having the Kabutops to use for the second half of my game. I'm not, dude, I'm at the part where you catch Lugia. I'm halfway through the game. I'm at the midway point. I've got a long way to go before I hit Cinnabar Island. So how long did it take you to transfer all these Pokemon? Like three days. <laughs> Jeez. That's a long time. <laughs> it, it was all at work, though. It was all like during my work shifts. Your job is awesome. Eh, it's boring, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> Uh, yes, that's very, that is very comparable to knowing whether or not Mission 51 was supposed to be. <laughs> Boy, that was Great. a long way you to go for that. Yeah. for that. But, uh, I, but that's, I, that's the kind of person I am. I will resist that temptation because, the, believe me, but, I felt it. But I felt it. Yeah. I wanted it. I wanted it. Yeah, but here's the thing is you know you're going to get a Kabuto eventually. With this, you would never know. You know, that's also a good point. But, and and, and here's the other thing that I need to, to concede to is that I also like to blame people a lot for things. Like I, noticed. I love to have, no. that's like one of the things in my life that I love. I love blaming people for things. Mind <laughs> Alone. And so I would love to have a definitive person to be able to blame for episode fifty one if it was a catastrophe. If it was his contention if it was Kojima's intention the entire time, that's fine. I'm okay with that. I can reconcile that easily. Fair enough. Alrighty, well, we're yeah. through our first news story. Back to the news. Okay. Uh, following the success of Pikachu earlier this year. We, we were out of the music bed. I thought, wait, did is this? We did we not need to do this anymore? Oh, I'm sorry. It was such a good news intro. I thought we needed it twice. Man, it's so not cool. There, you have your you have your music. You back. talked you, over the production. Can you? Yeah, can you complain less? You talked over the. production. I made a good point. God damn it! Kidding, I had a good story. Obviously, y'all go fuck yourself. Great. <laughs> Great point about not succumbing to temptation when you just stole all of Robbie's Pokemon. Great, great story. <laughs> not all of them. Just the just ones, the ones he, that you wanted. No, just the ones he didn't want. <laughs> Following the success of Pikachu earlier this year, Build-A-Bear has introduced an Eevee plush. The standard plush starts at $28, but as always, you can add on accessories. There's even an online exclusive one that you can order for like 60 bucks. Yeah, I, I did see that. Uh, I wonder if you can... I kind of want the EV Plus. I, I wonder if you can, like other Build-A-Bear uh, products, that you can have one of those squeeze boxes put inside with... It, you, you know, you can even... You voice chip for it. Y yeah, yeah, you can you can uh, record anything on there. You can get it. You don't have to do the online exclusive for that either. You can just add that on at the store. Yeah. Yeah, so that is that is a thing. The upcoming... Mine would go, I wish I was Umbrian. <laughs> well, don't they all? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. I wish I was Caputo. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I would buy. A, I would buy a plush Caputo. I have no doubt. Yeah, <laughs> no true statement has ever been said. Audience, make it for me. Yeah, right after you finish Juxta's action figure. 
Whatever happened? Did, whatever ever, did you ever get that? No. 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 Mm, what a shame. The upcoming Forza 3 Motorsport will be seeing a small crossover with the Halo series with the introduction of the Warthog. Anyone who has played Halo 5 or Halo the Master Chief Collection will get a code to unlock the vehicle, which interestingly boasts the best suspension in the game. Interesting. Uh, it's not weird that they put the Warthog in. It's weird that they make it one of the... It's got the best suspension in the game. Yeah, actually, because that is a vehicle notorious for flipping. That too. I mean, I can't. I, yeah. I've not played that much Halo. I just know that when you're in a warthog, be prepared to bail. You're gonna, you're gonna flip a lot. Yeah, that's correct. I just like it's weird to see a game that comes only via having played another game having the best suspension yeah, in the that's game. True. Like, kind of pay to winny. I don't know. Ah, uh, yeah, a little bit. A cross promotiony. It's, it's a, it, ta it leaves a dirty yeah. taste in the mouth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, an interesting statistic on the Xbox One shows just how slow the it's... The Xbox One? Yeah, the Xbox One. Have the Xbox that? One? <laughs> Ugh, idiots. Do, do they do uh, uh, moonsaults from the top rope? Probably. Yay. Was Xbox able to do a top so rope moonsault? Yeah. Yeah, that was his thing, man. Really? Shooting Star Press? That was his... Th yeah. Not Shooting Star... He didn't do the Shooting Star Press, but it was the moonsault. That, yeah. was, his, right. that was his, like, signature. Xbox is alive. Bro, yes, when he was he the... Is. When he he is. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, you're correct. Yeah, Sean, whatever his name is. Waltman. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I was trying to say Tupac, but with X. <laughs> I didn't know oh. that X-Pac was a person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, oh. when he was the one, two, three kid, that was like his... If you if, if he was in a video game, because he was only in like one or two of them, mm -hmm. that, was his, that was his finisher, was the uh, moonsault. An interesting statistic on the Xbox One shows just how slow its Japan sales were. Lifetime, the system has moved less than 70,000 units in Japan and sold only 52 systems last week. <laughs> to be fair, I don't think Xbox has that good of uh, uh, a, a career in Japan either. <laughs> mm, you think you're correct. Yeah, I think he struggles in Japan too. They have that in common. <laughs> <laughs> Both Marvel's Avengers Alliance and its recently released sequel will be shutting down at the end of this month. The free-to-play mobile games were fairly well-reviewed, so it came as a surprise to many when Disney announced they would both be closing down. Oh, they were quoted boo. as saying, at this time, we are shifting our development... Oh, you gotta say that in a special official-sounding voice, bro. Uh, all right. At this time, ha -ha, we are shifting our development <laughs> focus towards other online and mobile play experiences. Ha -ha. And the growing selection oh of Disney mobile apps. We deeply appreciate your enthusiasm, ha -ha, and loyal support for Marvel <laughs> Avengers Alliance, and sincerely hope you will continue to enjoy the large variety of online and mobile play experiences Disney offers. See you soon. Ha -ha. <laughs> oh my god. Are they happy? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's appropriate. What though. were you hoping for? I don't know, like Obama or something. Why? Why would Ob Official Obama Obama's not run Disney? He runs everything. Mickey Mouse runs Disney. Yeah, he's he. At least he picked the right character. He you don't. You don't even know. Nick Fury. You don't even it's know. It's Marvel Avengers. Can you do a Sam Jackson? No. No. And I wouldn't even bother trying. Yeah, that would be because if you fuck that one up, I there's do just Sam no, Jackson. The, the, you do not shut up. No, I said I would do Sam. Oh, Jackson. okay, that I believe. Uh. Okay. <laughs> Lindsay Lohan went after Take Two Interactive for using. Gay! Can we can we cha can we chain him to a radiator and film it? <laughs> Jeez, is that possible? Why would you want to do that to Sam Jackson? Well, Christina Ricci was in a movie where she was chained to a radiator and it had Sam Jackson. Yeah, but how many degrees do you need to go to get to Kevin Bacon? Well, hopefully only two if the game says anything. <laughs> six degrees. Oh, is it? Yeah, six degrees. Whatever. Lindsay Lohan went after Take-Two Interactive for using what she claimed was her likeness in Grand Theft Auto V, <laughs> claiming a billboard of a bikini-clad blonde was based off of her. And to be fair, she did have a picture that was strikingly, tri strikingly similar. She attempted to sue. However, her case was probably thrown out. What? Because of course it was. A dumb it, it doesn't even look like her. No, no it doesn't. You it know... You know who it looks like? It looks like, um, oh no, what is the one blonde that, uh, Kate Upton. Upton. It looks like Kate it Upton. It does look like Kate Upton, you're yeah. right. Yeah. So I, she's a shoe. She, well, no, I think. She's, it's still going to get thrown out. It wasn't, I, I, I know that there was a model that was used for it, but I thought Kate Upton actually either gave Rockstar permission or got some money out of him for it. I don't remember, but I thought Kate Upton was, like, her name was thrown around as like a tangential part of the lawsuit 
Okay. And that and that may have been part of the reason that it was thrown out because she was actually compensated. I don't know this for the, sure. The judge, I, I the can't judge remember. Said something to the effect of that the the game did not like reference her by name no. and it's at best a parody work of her, so it's free. It's fair to use. I oh yeah. She tried to do this a while ago to uh, Rockstar. Oh yeah. She, yeah. 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 She's trying she, to get money. She, oh, <laughs> because she can't make any on right, her own anymore. Right. It's what happens when you do a whole bunch of blow. <laughs> a lot. Yeah! Like just too much blow. I mean, there, there's as opposed possible to like damage. a little bit of blow where yeah, it's fine. There's like a responsible amount of blow. She's uh, she's please freaking, blow responsibly. Yeah, <laughs> she's right. freaking Scarface sitting with a table full of it. I, that's what I that's what I had always envisioned. I mean, did you ever see Herbie the Love Bug? <laughs> oh God, I did. I did too. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I masturbated to that. That's more unfortunate. <laughs> All right, we're talking about the one with Lindsay Lohan in it, right? Yeah. Not the not the original no. one? No. The one that was decent? Version. No. Had a Buddy Hackett in it. It was great. <laughs> you jacked off to Buddy Hackett, I, didn't you? Yeah. I sure did. Damn it. You bug. figured it out. <laughs> Good God. Buddy, buddy whack it. I whack it to Buddy Hackett. <laughs> no. Da, 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 da. Oh, this new segment has come undone. YouTube has for a long while had a policy of demonetizing videos with a... <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Good night, everybody. <laughs> ah, sorry. Oh, my God. YouTube has for a long while had a policy of demonetizing videos with objectionable material in them. Now, however, however, they've become more transparent about it, flagging videos and emailing creators to let them know which videos are being demonetized. While they didn't make any changes to which videos are having ads stripped out of them, the resulting confusion has fueled anger and hashtag YouTube is over party. Uh, that has been running wild on Twitter with over 175,000 tweets. And that's just since like last night. Yeah, this seems like a pretty serious issue. So what? here's, here's what's happening so channels that either use coarse language or talk about contentious or uh um uh what's the word controversial topics uh like i don't know maybe us this channel oh we have a couple of those oh we do we do um so apparently for about the past year youtube has been trying to make its agreement with uh, its agreements with advertisers that advertise on YouTube more agreeable by making sure that advertisers are getting their ads played on content that they don't find objectionable right things they would want attached to their company right which it's prompted YouTube to create this program and and by extension, an algorithm that would identify specific videos that either used excessive course language or talked about a controversial topic and took their monetization and either reduced it dramatically or cut it completely. Yep. Now the in problem the, is like in the same way in the same way that YouTube videos are being flagged for content uh, violations. It is very similar to what is going on here, where it's an automated process. And now that it has been made, and it's and it's very not that, public. It's it's very public because what they did was, it, it, you know, before you would have to really go into your analytics. And look at it like a day by day breakdown and know roughly what you earn in monetization for any given video. You'd actually have to go through your analytics tools and find it on the chart to be able to discover oh, this video isn't getting, despite the fact that it has 100,000 views, I'm not seeing an increase in my revenue. Most channels would put that stuff out there and take what it take just take in whatever revenue would would come in and not i mean i would say i'm not i don't want to speak for youtube channels because i we're not spoiler alert we're not really a youtube channel if you're watching this on youtube right now guess what final encountercast.com is where we actually put the main product and youtube for us total afterthought it's all gravy total afterthought okay so you know what YouTube, uh, it, you know, like YouTube creators, I think don't actually use all of the analytics tools that they're given. I think a lot of them really take that 
kind of stuff for granted. And so not many YouTube creators knew that this was even going on, that based on their content, that their videos were being flagged for inclusion and monetization or not. And once YouTube made that a part of the tools that are provided for creators to see exactly which videos were being monetized and which weren't, a lot of very vocal, notable YouTube creators came out and said, wow, this is really messed up. You know, like, uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there's, there's a handful of uh, specific pieces of content that people have pointed to to say, you know, this is something specifically that I, this is the reason I think that this video got taken off. Uh, the, what is it, the Brock Turner rape case yeah. was one of those. Some, any, any, uh, it was almost any video with that tag was absolutely taken out of monetization. Yep. And this, now, I, there's well the problem is I, like everything else with YouTube it only kind of works yes it doesn't it's not and, working the way it's supposed to and a lot of creators have contested this decision and it's gone to a review before a human and they've gone oh yeah no this is totally fine working as intended no 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 they, no oh. saying it, like reversing the decision oh, reverse, yeah oh okay and and allowing for monetization on these videos but that doesn't that doesn't include the time that they lost of since not. posting the video and and making this appeal. And it's only recently, within the last couple of weeks, that we've even seen an appeal process be possible. So Right, and, and I mean the biggest problem there is that the bulk of your views on a video come in the first few weeks after release. You're right. So if you gotta wait a few weeks before you can actually start monetizing on it, you miss out on a big videos, chunk of it. Videos on YouTube are rarely slow burners. Yeah. They, they rarely have them up for a couple of months and then people find them. That doesn't happen very often, especially with a content creator who's making week over week or even daily content, right? Yep. A lot of these people, you know, a lot of these creators do rely on YouTube as a major source of income, a gigantic source of income for them. And so... I think that it's, I mean, I have two opinions here, right? Like, first of all, I find it really, really troubling that YouTube is cherry picking certain pieces of content or certain topics to blanketly say, well, you can't make money. I mean, a lot of people come to YouTube to make money. It's not altruism that brings people here. I mean, it's just like us. You know, we're we're embarking on this big endeavor to make a new show that's going to be on terrestrial radio. And why are we doing that? Well, it's not to fulfill, you know, like for as much as it does fulfill a childhood dream of mine, that's not why we're doing it. It's because it has the potential to make us a lot of ad money. That's one of the driving reasons that we're doing this. Hey, uh, full full disclosure, if you think that we're above making money here at Limit Break Radio and Final Encountercast, you're wrong. You're wrong. We want to do this full time. We want to do this even more. And so to be able to do that, that takes funding. We got to be able to eat. We got to be able to pay for rent. We got to be able to pay for equipment. All of that takes money. And unless I want to divide my time between doing this and working my ass off at a, uh, at, you know, at a radio station or, worst case scenario, a Subway or a McDonald's, <sighs> if I wanted to split my time between doing that and doing this, we could continue doing the show every week on Twitch with your support on Patreon until, you know, we... Until the cows come yeah, home. Yeah, right. Exactly. But to be able to take it to the next level, we can't, on, I mean, we, we, and we said this before, we can't honestly ask our audience to, to bear that responsibility. That's got to be on us somehow. Right. So, you know, well, here, and so here's the other side of my opinion. While I find it really troubling that YouTube is, t it, it, I mean, is using content like the Brock Turner rape case as, a reason to allow or not allow somebody to make money at the same time this is YouTube site this is Google site they own YouTube when you signed up for YouTube and you signed up for the uh, with all those terms of service you agreed to their rules 100% 
No, you don't get to you know you don't get to rewrite the terms of service. That's not something that you have. You know, you don't get to put an addendum in there. You don't get to put an asterisk in there and go, oh, but this part doesn't apply to me. Right. You are completely beholden to their rules, which means that if they want to change the rules mid-game, they can do that. Because you said, I agree. So, if you are a channel or you are a content creator that is relying 100% off of your income from the hits that you receive on YouTube, you're a bad business person. You're bad. You're bad at business. And I'll tell you why. Because no one, no one who does this seriously only has one income source. No one who does this and is an upstart and does it DIY with, you know, not a whole lot of backing, nobody does it that way. Nobody does it that way. And it's stupid to do it that way because you limit your options for the most vital thing that you need for your show or for your product to succeed. And, you're, and you are completely beholden to anyone else's rules. I mean, that's why we have LimitBreakRadio.com and we distribute the show as a podcast. It's why we have FinalEncountercast.com and we distribute it as a podcast and we think of the show and, the, and, and our product as a podcast and not a YouTube show. We did not. We decided not to monetize our videos on YouTube yep. because we knew that it wasn't reliable. Well, and I mean, it's the same thing for like Twitch. We would never let it get to a point where we were dependent on Twitch. Exactly. For our Twitch income that we get out there, it's great. It's gravy. We love it. Yes. But we don't depend on it. Right. It should be, it, you should look at YouTube income as a bonus. It, this is just like the, the musicians who will look at the amount of plays that they get off of Spotify or off of YouTube, and then they go, well, why aren't I getting any money off of the six million plays that I, that I got on Spotify this month? The reason... For that is because that is your promotion. You need to look at that like artists used to look at radio spins. That's your ex that's your exposure. What you need to do is you need to sell people on the quality of your work to make them buy the record, to make them right. come out to the show. That's where you make your money. Right. There, yeah. Spotify is your gateway to being able to sell merch or being able to sell yes. tickets or being yes. able to sell a CD. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And we sort of look at it, you know, in the same way. YouTube is just a way for more people to find the show. It's not a way, it's not the way that we prop up this business. And for those YouTube creators who have been put in a position where, like, their channels may disappear, have only themselves to blame. Honestly, I, it's not that I don't have sympathy for them. I do. And it's a shitty decision that Google has made. But are you that surprised? Honestly, when you think about it, are you really that surprised? That maybe, maybe McDonald's doesn't want their logo splashed across the 14-minute the rant that you did about abortion? <laughs> yeah. You know, like, the, McDonald's is a company that is really careful about what it advertises either side of on the news. Right. Don't sit here and tell me that they don't have a vested interest on what they advertise around, because they absolutely do. And they're going to be put, they're the ones that put pressure on sites like YouTube that are the distributors of this content. And they're the ones coming to them and saying, look, we're going to take our money elsewhere unless you can ensure that our ads are running around the content that we find personally acceptable. Acceptable, right? I, this is this Which, I mean, that, from an advertising perspective, that's not even unreasonable. No, that's just like it's course. not. Yeah, okay. It's not for people who have dealt with advertisers as a part of their profession, like I have. I'm, you know, being a broadcaster for almost 15 years. You know that there is, there's a certain amount of expectation that comes along with it. And either you're willing to go out on a limb and take the risk and, and continue to put you know, your version of, of uh, your opinions out there and uh, you know, take the consequences, even if that means a, an advertiser walking and, right. and really holding, holding to your morals. Like I think YouTube should have done and said, you know, 
fine if you want to take your advertising bucks somewhere else like i'd like to see you find a platform that has more exposure yeah they probably could have played hardball yeah i and and i think that youtube caved i mean youtube caved on this one and and i i mean i would hold them responsible for this whole debacle but i mean we've seen we've seen what youtube creators can do in terms of the internal narrative and the internal conflict that happens in youtube they have a lot of pull they have a lot of power yeah and this subject is not done it's not going away uh and you know the fact that it's been exposed to the degree that it has i think that's all that's all for for the benefit and that's and it's good that we have people like philip defranco it's good that we that we have people like pewdiepie uh talking about this issue etc news and ricky sure. you know ricky and all and those it, guys it's good that we have them talking about this issue because this this is exactly what, I mean, this really just sort of made me feel good about the decisions I, I, I've made for our show and our site. Well, and discussion's always proactive, so the fact that this issue is being brought to light and being discussed should produce a more positive result. I, I would hope so. I, and it really depends on what uh, on, on what kind of pressure YouTube legitimately feels. If it feels like some of its biggest creators are going to walk because of this, and they could, and, and they would, I think they would be justified to walk, too, that... Yeah, they may be in some serious problems. Well, in, in some level, they can also play a little bit of hardball with their creator, saying, That's "Where you like, if you leave, I don't care where you go, a big chunk of your audience isn't following you." That's true. We've seen the difficulty of pivoting. No, you're you're not wrong. You're not. You're absolutely not wrong. But are they, are they putting themselves at more risk by pivoting to a platform that they know will have? an output that is reliable yep. and and a company that deals with them in a very straight-faced manner or do they want to keep putting up with Google's you know either draconian or backhanded backdoor policies that have an effect on their income and their output but that they have to wait a year to find out like i i think that that's as big of a problem creatively as trying to pivot well there's never been a more like open space for a new content distributor to pop up and try and fill this gap because there's a lot of angry people you could swipe away from youtube you know right you're now. not you're not wrong that's not a bad it's not a bad positioning statement for someone who is trying to compete with youtube and we'd like to announce our new content distribution network me tube blue Me-tube. tube <laughs> yeah right uh yeah. you noob <laughs> yeah that's not bad there we go that's not bad i like that look forward to it it's all bad <laughs> okay so i guess i'm wrong <laughs> all right then don't patronize him <laughs> don't give him false hope <laughs> Uh, 20 years after the release of Duke Nukem 3D, much of the original design team has returned to give a new chapter to the game. The eight-level chapter will cost $19.99, can be played in the original graphics or updated, includes a commentary from the original design team, the entire original game, and will be available on PlayStation, Xbox, and PC October 11th. Holy shit. It's not bad. I mean, like you get the original game, all that stuff, you get it in redone graphics or the original graphics, a new chapter 20 years later. Holy they got John St. John to do the voice, the original music uh, for the composer. The guy, composer. Yeah. He's nice. back to do the music for That's it. That's cool. It's pretty cool. I, I mean, like, it's it just seems like such a nostalgia grab. It really oh, yeah. does. I mean, hey, th- three year olds, like, we haven't put out anything in a bit. More Duke. Yeah. Like the trailer for it was kind of neat. It's like a, a, a Duke running for president sort of thing, and it's his campaign <laughs> oh, uh, platforms. Great. Yeah, he's going to take a hard line stance against alien invasions. So oh, you better well, remember it. Yeah, that's not surprising. Make them build a wall. I mean, <laughs> give it. Yeah, seriously. I mean, given his history with alien invasion, absolutely I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, overall, yeah, it's a nostalgia grab, but like for the price point, it seems about right. And fair I mean, enough. Sounds cool. New new chapter. Fair enough. Into it. All righty, and. Uh, EVE Online will be adopting a free-to-play model this November. They aren't doing away with their subscription model, but instead will now have two tiers of characters, Omega and Alpha clones. Omega clones will be the pay model and will remain largely unchanged from what the players currently experience in the game. Alpha clones will be the free-to-play model and will have some limitations in the game, most notably only being able to use certain ships and skills related to the faction that they choose. Uh, I think that this is interesting because this is like one of only maybe a half dozen games that are left that even had a subscription model uh, that they could rely on. And they're going to the hybrid system. And they are. Yeah. yeah. I, I, mean, I kind of like it, though. Why, a- uh, why is that? 
I mean, I think it's a way that you'll, because really when you go to something free, like the people who are already paying are not going to stop paying. When you add the free the option, you're going to drag, you're going to pull people into the game who probably either are returning to the game and are like, well, if it goes free to play, I'll play again. Sure. Or a new player who is interested because maybe they have a friend playing. So you'll get people playing. And if you get a, even a couple people who are like, hey, this is actually fun. I'm going to upgrade. It's win. Okay. Especially if they add any kind of little microtransactions along with the free, like it's all profit. So this I don't like, think they're going to see a drop in p- from paid people going down to the free. Not at all. Isn't this just a <laughs> just like a trial version, though? If like, I mean, when they say that only certain models of the ship can be used as an alpha clone, I feel that just to me screams that you won't be able to win in PvP. I I think what it it means is like you're you're right. You're you're not going to be flying your capital ships probably, but every army, every fleet has to have guys running the rifters, the scouts and whatnot. You might be able to take that role in the battle. Holy crap, he actually knows things about this game. <laughs> what a L- fucking nerd. Look at this idiot. <laughs> um dork. N- I, well, I think what the, uh, the what is the most interesting for this is that you know, yeah, you're right, Nika that it does drive new people to check it out maybe returning players to have it downloaded right like if if there's a game if there's an mmo that i played for a while and it goes free to play i generally have it downloaded on my desktop for at least a little while right Mm -hmm. but eve online has been one of these games that has sort of had this built-in audience around it because it's one of the few mmos that is space themed and also like so gigantic right like yeah. i mean wild star was space themed but i think they did it to a d- i don't know that much about wild star uh, granted i don't know that much about eve either eve's so you just don't know much n- n- right right okay eve is among us you're right right but no but I, I i feel like they both of those games offered something completely different and in terms of an online game that uses a space setting in a future setting that those are pretty hard to come by. So it seemed like they had a pretty locked-in audience. It didn't look like they had much competition. The only competition that they may have had was No Man's Sky, but that wasn't an on. It wasn't. It wasn't multiplayer right. at all. Well, and that's what I think is good about this is you're not really losing anything. Like right. you still have your pay model that people can do, and the people who are doing the pay model now probably will continue to do it because like this is already the game where you can earn game time in game just by playing. You can right. purchase. Uh, months of subscription time they, in the game. And they had that going before WoW did. Yes, they had that ages um, ago. And now, to to address, Chris, your comment that it sort of feels like, oh, well, if I don't fork over the money of that, I'll just automatically lose in PvP, that it's, it's sort of like a pay-to-win system. Right. Um, I, I it, To me, this feels like one of those, like, freemium MMO subscriptions, but sort of done in reverse, right? Like how on on uh, Elder Scrolls Online, right? Like you could play that once it went free to play. You could play that for free, but it also had an optional uh, a, an optional subscription that would get you additional mounts and sure. additional. Yeah, Elder Scrolls was kind of hybrid, wasn't it? Because I mean, it, like it people became that were hybrid. Yeah. subscription were still paying it, but I know that if you did the one without you like couldn't get as many gold coins and you couldn't do as many features like there's a lot of stuff that is restricted if you don't pay yeah i think a lot of that is sort of born out of the idea that these games launch with the intention to be subscription and they try to do subscription models for you know three or four months or six months or maybe even eight months to a year and then after that they find that it's no longer economically feasible and they've got to shrink and then at that point they usually adopt the hybrid free to play uh and that's where i think that's where the bulk of mmos are that we see these days uh you know like uh lord of the rings online is there elder scrolls online is there wild star is there star wars star wars is, yeah there's there's just a lot of games that have adopted this model yep. but i i mean i really wanted to spend a second and talk about the idea of a subscription model just going away as a concept because this is this is something that made a lot of sense kind of early on in MMOs because we knew that there were servers that people had to maintain that there was a, a there was a on hand staff of game masters and developers that had to be on hand and that most of these games were receiving at least quarterly if not 
uh, uh, monthly by, or uh, every well, other month, or I mean, six, every six months. Uh, you know, if if you were a bit on the longer side, or year if you were WoW. Um, but that th- these games would also see new content, and those were all of the things that your money was kind of going to support because they had no other way of being able to run maintenance on these right. uh, on these games uh, in a practical way, which. You know, a lot of uh, dude, a lot of gamers bought into that idea, and a subscription model made a hundred percent sense. But now, in today's market, I just want to real quick go over the games, the MMOs that still have a pure subscription model. That's Final Fantasy XI. That's Final Fantasy fourteen. I don't know if World of Warcraft even counts. I don't feel like it does. Because, yeah, you can earn your you, you can earn your game time. Right. Now. Yeah. You and, don't have to pay to play. So that leaves Ultima Online, which is still what subscription is that a based. Month? I don't Ten, even know. Was it know. ten bucks back? Don't in the day? even know. Don't I? I can't. Cannot recall. But I mean, that's EA, so they could conceivably have that running on an iMac in the corner for an eternity. And Dayak, Dark Age, Camelot, Bingo, Len got it. Dark Age Camelot's the only oh. other one. That's it. But, but if I picked up World of Warcraft today as a new player, I would have to pay first. Like, you can't just earn it right off the bat, right? There's like... Well, I mean, you, if you, you, pick you up, buy it with actual gold, don't you, or no? Well, you pick up the game, and you get a free month anyway. And well, then, no, but can, I mean, well, what she's saying is, like, can can anyone but a veteran player really take and reap the rewards yeah. of paying for your subscription in gold? Because I think it's a great plan for veterans. And I mean, Chris, you've obviously been playing mm-hmm. WoW for a really, really long time. It's a great option for you. But I think Nika raises a great question. If she bought the game today, installed it, after her 30 days, would she be able to generate enough money to play it for free? Conceivably. Without, without really, really grinding money. Okay, now is Nika a noob or yeah, like, like Nika's if it was a noob. like me, oh. like like if I was to go buy the game and be like, okay, well I hear it has the subscription model, so I'm gonna check it out. I'll I'll do it for free and then I'll see if I can get enough gold to keep playing. And if not, I'm gonna quit. Oh, so, okay, so Nika personally, no, no, Nika's a big noob. <laughs> yeah, she's I just, way too casual. I I, I think that what? I think that WoW would I, I think just I, I I understand the qualification that you guys are driving at, but I think for the sake of argument that we can still categorize WoW as a subscription okay. model, and I think we have to because it is still the the game that set the tone for the rest of the genre. Sure. It's still, still to this day, it still sets. The, it, it's it's really the the sort of like pace setter for the rest of the genre. That's still games you can count on one hand. Yeah, that's five. That's five total games. And so, you know, when we talk about FF14 and its uniqueness, like that's one of the things that that you can't ignore because having a modern MMO successful enough to sustain a subscription model is not an unnotable feat. I mean, that is pretty fucking remarkable. You got to hand it to Square Enix. They did make a successful and a pretty decent game in FF14. For as much as we criticize the product, yeah. they did. And the the proof there is that they've stood by the idea of a subscription-based model and no pay to win. I mean, we do have a cash shop, but it's no pay to win. But it's completely aesthetic, yeah. The question is, does Square Enix have the restraint to continue that 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 concept can they resist temptation enough like i did with the kabuto ha ha see i turned it all the way around full circle motherfucker <laughs> full circle don't you even give me that look <laughs> can can square enix resist temptation yeah to be able to continue to make a good game that doesn't either doesn't that doesn't fault falter on either one of those two points that doesn't go to either a freemium model or does not go the pay to win route as long as 14 stays as profitable as it is yes yeah i, I mean, think look at ele- if 11 is not a free to play by now I mean, they definitely are good at resisting. I, think, I don't know. I think Eleven's a different animal entirely. Yes. I think they at this point it doesn't make sense to put the development work needed to make Eleven not 
I'm making a free to play Yeah, model. you would have to actually restructure the way that that game functions to be able sure. to make it into a free model. Yeah. And, you know, like we were saying earlier, I think that the cost involved with running the game now is so low that it's, I don't think that... It just doesn't make sense to Yeah, do it. I, 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 it doesn't make sense. Because think of the amount of UI work and model work that... I mean, Square Enix would have to adjust play online. They'd have to... I mean, well, who wants maybe, to do I mean, any of that? They also haven't lowered the subscription. I feel like if it's that low to run the game and if they want to try to bring more people in, like, people might play for five bucks a month instead of 12. You're not wrong. But would twice as many people play, or three yeah. times as many people play? Okay, that's the that's, question. You know, that's yeah. if you're going to lower it to five from twelve ninety five, would three times as many people play? That's God, the question. No, I don't think anyone would play Final Fantasy Eleven at this stage. at any at any at any cost at any well, price. Well, I mean, I mean there, like, is there is there, a, is there a price that makes you go? That's too much. The only thing I could see them doing is offering like, hey, maybe uh, here's fourteen and eleven at eighteen a month or something like that. Well, they used to do that. Yeah, at one point now. And eleven, did. really? Yeah. yeah. If you yep. had a, if you yep. had a sub to uh, fourteen, you got a uh, a reduction on your sub to yeah. eleven. You also got in game item in yeah. fourteen. Yeah. Boy. I really feel like the the segment of people that actually want to get into Final Fantasy eleven and the segment of people that can't afford twelve dollars a month <laughs> don't intersect. Or is that like, crossover? Okay, I, that's fair. I feel like if people are going to play Final Fantasy Eleven, they're gonna do so regardless of the price. That's it's fair. for the love of the game, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's wrong. fair. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I mean I guess it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to turn FF eleven free to play. Although if you did go free to play, it really would bring a lot of people back into the game. Like a lot of people would 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 play it again. I mean, look at the login weekends. The login weekends you'll get yeah. a you'll get a pretty good spike in people. Yeah, but that's just cuz it's only free for that weekend. Like if it was free to play forever, I don't think people would come in in droves cuz they're Maybe like, oh, not. oh, I can do that later. Maybe not. You know, that's a good point. I mean, I've I've had Guild Wars 2 uh sitting on my desktop unupdated for uh, you know, probably a, you know, since the last time I had to wipe my computer. So, yeah, you know, that's that's you're not wrong. You're not wrong. I'm never wrong. <laughs> you're well, wrong a lot, uh, actually. I, I don't know. I'm the Kristoff. <laughs> Wow! No, notice how you're the only one that calls yourself Kristoff. I'm standing nobody, by that. Nobody else calls you Kristoff. I stand. N- the by intro that. does not call you Kristoff. Do your, does anyone in your family or friends call you Kristoff anywhere in your life? Kind of. <laughs> my family calls me Kristoff Fur because my mom is. Oh. I hate what? It. I don't feel good. I hate. It. What was so ugh about that? But nobody calls you Kristoff, yet you insist on calling yourself that. Well, like not even you know what? Callie gets a new that. name. You get to stay Nika. Hashtag Chris is always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Chris uh. is the best. <laughs> so I go by Nika in like a real settings as well, like conventions and stuff. So you don't go by Kristoff anywhere. Yeah. Because no one will call me it. <laughs> well, why do you think that is? Because they're just jealous. Because it's awesome patently that name ridiculous, <laughs> and it's also not anywhere on any of your pieces of identification. And also, now that any anyone that is anyone has seen Frozen, that's all people think about when they're yeah. Kristoff. So. Yeah, I yeah. think that's why he wants to be called Kristoff because he wants to pretend that he's no, from Frozen. No, no, Kristoff oh, yeah. in the Frozen is with a F, two Fs. Oh, oh yeah, the, the I'm with it's a PH. A K, Wait, <laughs> yeah. I, I and spe- it's a K, isn't it? Yeah, also. I was spelling yeah. K R I S. That's not how I'm supposed to spell that. Oh God. Hmm. Yeah, someone CH, should have a ridiculous name. The uh, the, uh, the the primo Chris's just can't stand those fake Chris's with the K R I S. Mm. Is that right? It's it's terrible. Mm. That's my mom. Oh, you son yeah. of a bitch! I already know what you're doing. <laughs> Fuck you! <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, 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 poor baby! Oh, little baby, go go cry now. What uh, happened? He got up and stormed out. <laughs> Aww. Now we've he's got sad. two K names. He, he's sad because he has a K on his name. Aww. I've got a K on my name. What's wrong with having a K on your name? I don't know. Yeah, my mom's name is Chris with a K. <laughs> That's that I'm makes like. it even better because yeah. your mom. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, but it, I, I just... I don't know why I tell you anything I hate. Uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, I, I do think that we are now in an age... Like, first of all, the MMO as a genre is totally on its, it's way out. Oh, Oh, yeah. yeah. It feels clunky. You, you think so? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, there were two MMOs, two MMOs that were notable this year or visible this year that came out. Both of them flopped hard. Blade and Soul was good for like <laughs> was that this ten year? Yeah, Was that this yeah, year, that though? Was, Wasn't that beginning of, beginning of the year? Right? No, it was the beginning of the year. I thought that year. game was older than that, though. Uh, it is. It's a <laughs> Korean game yeah. that's been around for a while, but it's, it's it U.S. out quick. It's U.S. release came out here. Yeah, and I mean, there was a lot of attention paid to it, and then it, yeah, you're exactly right, Len, it flamed out. Totally what flamed out. The other one was Black Desert Online. Which oh yeah, I was supposed to play that. <laughs> I I don't know that the that the release even moved the needle because Blade and Soul was I mean it moved the needle for like six weeks. Eight it weeks. paid to move the needle. That's true. Yeah. Oh my god, I forgot about that. How'd you forget and, about that? NC Soft we, NC we Soft th- so much. threw so much money at Twitch streamers to just sit around and play their game, and it's funny because I don't think a lot of the Twitch streamers were really that pleased with it. I mean, because no one they stuck... They said they were, but... Yeah, yeah, you well, know, that, when, too, you, yeah. when you sign the contract to say that you're pleased with it, then, of course, that's going to happen. When also, some of it might be like a honeymoon type of thing. I know when I start eh. a new game, it's like you make your own character and you're in a new world for like the first three days. Like It feels Here, cool. Here's like, the pro- Yeah, you, you, you know what, Nika? I'll concede that you might be right, but you get money involved on yeah. any level... And then I start questioning motives. I don't. It, you know what I mean? Like it. it there's. Yeah. You know. Someone in the chat said, "Reset the clock to zero from Last Blade and Soul Insult." There you go. <laughs> they got the timer going. Good. It's actually pretty funny. Good. Nobody cares what? about your shitty Korean empty game. What about the division? Oh, was that? That's not even an MMO. Is it? Or no? I don't know. It's a, I mean, it is on. It is an online experience. I don't know. Is, is it not massive? It is. I mean, it's, is it it's an MMO. It's a persistent. It's a persistent world. Yeah, I, maybe that's what throws me off. Is but that is it's this an stuff FPS. like League of Legends MMO FPS or is it different? Uh, well, League of Legends not FPS, is a but like game. MMO tile games, like same things with like um, Overwatch. Like they have the no, no, no. I mean, it, it, I don't know. It felt like a, it very much felt like a third person shooter, like in any average third person shooter, but it was just online. Yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't call it an MMO. No, I don't know that I would. I mean, it was online for sure, but I don't know that I would call it an MMO. Okay. But it definitely did flop, though. I mean, it definitely goes to support our idea that all of these games have been massive failures. Yeah, but then there's things like League of Legends and Overwatch, which is something about... I don't know if it's the competitive nature of it more so, um, or if it's just some something about the gameplay, but those are all massively online. But none of those have had a subscription model attached to them at all. And I, and I, I mean, MMOs is a Legends genre. That's a weird thing, though, doesn't well, it? Well, yeah, no, League, look, they have their own way to monetize, but you can download League for free. So and there's there's no there's no barrier for entry. They have, you know, like when you, when you bring the barrier for entry down that low, you bring a lot of expectations down. If, I, if I'm able to download a game for free, I don't expect it to be very good. I'm pleasantly surprised if it's awesome. Well, in League and other MOBA games, like they don't have a persistent world. Like that's you, right. Like, you log in one day and it's yeah, it's, uh, okay, it's just a game. True. You go that's and you true. play the game's over, then you play again. Right. Okay. Well, oh, Destiny. That's yeah. What about Destiny? Up. Okay, Destiny. I think was that MMO this year though. FPS? You said this year. I I think that was last year that it that it Destiny had come out. last year. But, yeah. but still, it, still. I mean, but that one was successful very much so for like few months yeah not yeah. very long it's still successful isn't it? i don't i mean it's it they haven't shut the servers down but they're also I mean, it's not also the expansions made it yeah. a bit better yeah they had uh, well they have E3, division e3 is, coverage about their destiny thingies uh well so did the division but i don't think that anyone thought that it was terribly good i don't think that that means anything what about pokemon go <laughs> what about pokemon go mmo no you can't call it that at least until we can see other players on the map. Yeah, no. Which I don't know exactly it's, how It's that an works. online no, game, no but it's not sky. an MMO. No, it's <laughs> no multiplayer elements of that at all. You just can't see anyone because you're so far away. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> no, I'm pretty curious. If I played No Man's Sky, would it even engage my network port? Would I even see data packets be transferred across for that game? I don't think I would. I think it's just a solely first person experience well no hold on uh it has to send the data packets to the server so it knows like what planets have been named by whatever you did right i there guess are, yeah, yeah right. so there it you does go. connect to a server at certain times yeah. i just like, like <laughs> games that we think of as a traditional mmo those are definitely on the way out oh yeah like 
there I would be surprised to ever see another game like Final Fantasy 14 or WoW at this point. Yeah, I I don't think that we'll ever get another Final Fantasy MMO. I mean, I honestly I think with with where we're at with 15, I think it's debatable whether we'll see another Final Fantasy game. Period. Okay, well, see, but on. we've been saying that for years. So uh, no, everyone's well, like, after this one, I'm done with. This not, game not. Forever, I'm so. done, but the company might move on. Yeah. Let's say yeah, that I doubt it. That Square Enix survives, well, or the company might tank and fold in on itself. The company survives Final Fantasy 15. Okay. <laughs> Let's say it survives good, that. Good luck. Just hypothetically. All right. And 12 years down the line, when Final Fantasy 14 is nearing its last legs, just like Final Fantasy 11, you don't yeah. think they're going to have another no. Final Fantasy 18 in the works? I don't think the MMO model will exist at that point. Nope. I doubt sure it. Sure don't. Sure don't. We, I think... Well, we, I, might I mean, see, we might see that as games continue to progress and get bigger and bigger, we may see the the what we think of as an MMO today that may just become the standard gameplay. Sure, that may just be what games look and, like. And, by that and point. I, that's actually the point that that I was uh, kind of working my way towards was that you know like a lot of the games that we consider traditionally single player experiences have multiplayer elements. I mean, think of Dark Souls. Dark Souls with its PvP element and its ability to watch other players shades move around in the world and be summoned into other worlds i actually think that that's probably a little bit closer to what we'll end up seeing in the future of all games making mmos a little bit obsolete because the multiplayer aspect will be built in i think if, for, for a, i was just going to say for a long time multiplayer was relegated to either split screen or ne you know purely networking and now we have tons of options when it comes to how games interact with the network and how games will operate with other people playing on that network and i think that that is i i think developers will be much more interested in exploring those options because it's a little bit more innovative because we've locked ourselves into a very 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 well-worn pattern with mmos yes so i think it's a little bit more creatively satisfying and i think it's in a budgetary sense way more feasible and i think that's what's going to contribute to the death of the mmo is as and just how expensive it is well how expensive it is but as these games things like dark souls and things uh they start incorporating some mmo elements into their standard gameplay people aren't going to want to pay a sub model for that anymore yeah like hey, i can get this in just this in you know any other game, why am I paying a and sub? Again, and again, we're down to five games that hold a sub model up as like, this is what we do. A pure sub model. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, I think that's, that's remarkable. That is remarkable, considering that it was just 10 years ago, what, 2006, that we saw a huge MMO boom right in the wake of WoW. Yep. I mean, yeah. Just the biggest MMO boom. There is an MMO for everything, and and I mean some of them are still coming out. Some of them have taken a long time. Some of them, some of them are coming out as browser games or browser MMOs, stuff like that. But I mean, like Naruto Online, you've got these these like IPs out there that are are everyone tried to make an MMO at one point. I mean, and that's where you got Elder Scrolls Online. Yep. That's where you... The Matrix Online. Oh, oh my god, The Matrix Online. How can you what mess that up? Dog, a game that should have been great. What a dog dick of a game. Yeah. I don't so think I even bad. knew that existed. Oh, I, trash. I was in the beta. <laughs> oh. I was in the beta. It was awful. I played it at CMU. Yeah. I wanted to play that game because, like, how do you mess it up? And then it came out and I blinked and oh, I was that's dead. Oh, that's yeah. And I'm like, oh, it's the con already? The combat system was the worst I've ever seen in an MMO. The worst I ever played was DC Universe Online. Ooh, that, that is That game was awful. I feel, I feel like the Matrix could have had so much fun with like how Max Payne has that like yes. slowing time thing. That would have been so cool. The Matrix should have been great. It's a ready-made concept. How do you make bullet time work in an MMO exactly? Ooh. It frees uh, everybody uh, uh, else. <laughs> I don't know. The yeah, whole server. It would be... That would be kind of tough to do. But they tried to do that. Like, you would have to engage an enemy, and then you had, like, four different commands that you could choose from, and one of them made you look like you were, like, you know, jumping in midair and avoiding bullets. But really, it was just... It was a mess. It was such a mess of a game. Yeah. 
Um, another another feature that that game boasted was modeled and designed building interiors that you could go into and explore. But what they didn't tell you is that there were only eight buildings <laughs> with four corridors in the whole thing that you could go in and explore. The rest of them were painted rocks. So that. I mean, that game was just such a clusterfuck of problems. Uh, remember City of Heroes? Yeah, I remember City of Heroes. I like that game. Did you? Did you? How long did you play that? Not very long. No, I played like maybe like level like thirteen or sixteen. I just liked making new heroes. Uh, that was that was one uh, that they had shut. They shut that down early. They shut that down in like twenty. 2009 2008 something like that so a year after release wasn't, long, wasn't no, no it wasn't it wasn't a year after release it was a couple of years after really? release yeah cuz i had a fr- i had a, a professor in college mm-hmm. that did a, a radio channel all about uh city of heroes it was called woot radio we actually we did our first extra life broadcast with them oh wow i bet his podcast is doing great now no it's gone why <laughs> oh, did you not hear? What? What happened? Is he is he okay? Oh, you you didn't know? Oh, well. is is your professor dead? No, City of Heroes is gone. Oh, at least I have my City of Villains. <laughs> oh wait, how about Star Trek Online? Oh, it wasn't good. No, it wasn't. It's pretty bad. No, no. There's everyone's favorite straw man for why hardcore MMOs will never work, and that's Wild Star. Oh, look, they made it really hard, so n- nobody wanted to play it. Actually, they made it look really stupid and unappealing <laughs> in terms of the graphics, and it wasn't an IP that anyone gave a shit about in the first place. It never attracted enough people to gain traction in the first fucking place. And you had all of... Uh, the only the only attraction point that that game had at all was that it was set in space, yeah, because that's yeah. that's kind of like that's kind of unique for an MMO. Let's be honest. Yeah. But the second thing was that it was supposedly diff- more difficult. It was made for the MMO, the hardcore MMO player. That's what they set up their end game for. That's why a lot of people had switched to it, and then it ended up being terrible. Not a lot of people liked it. Forgetting about the fact that nobody gave a shit about WildStar outside of that game. I mean, with Final Fantasy and Warcraft, it and and I mean Elder Scrolls, you have a reason to give a shit about that world. How many people do you meet who say, "Oh, yeah, I've played all the Final Fantasy games except the online ones"? A lot, oh, like, a lot, all the time. A lot. Yeah, people and, care about the series outside of the online. And games. that's and actually, you know what? That's something that we didn't. I don't think we did consider enough when we were talking about Eleven on Limit Break Radio today. Was that, you know, we didn't really consider the appeal that the brand name Final Fantasy has for people who have just never explored the world. Yeah. That that does actually have some pull for people. Just like the Warcraft name. Just like, you know, Star Wars. Those have been at least modestly successful releases. Star Wars, it took a little bit for the decline to happen. Uh, Old Republic. And then when it happened. And then when it happened. Oh, my God. They called it the Tortanic for a reason. And, it, it, you know, Wildstar never had any of those factors. Wildstar only had the buzz in the internal, insular MMO community. Well, yeah. Hey, guys, it's hard and it's in space. But then people were like, uh, don't we already have you online for that? Right, exactly. And and they were like, I'm just going to go back to playing WoW anyway. Yeah. The only people that were remotely interested in Wildstar from the outset were people who were already playing MMOs. That's the problem that I have when people hold up Wildstar as a reason that you can't have X content in FF14. That's the most annoying thing. Well, it failed on Wildstar... Nobody yeah, nobody was playing Wildstar that wasn't already playing MMOs. And I get it that that's a big pool of people granted how many subscriptions there are to WoW. But you're only getting disaffected WoW players. That's it. That's your that's your potential audience. Nobody outside of that gives a shit. People outside of 
uh, an MMO audience give a shit about the Final right. Fantasy name? If a, if a commercial comes on for Wildstar, people will just look at it and be like, whatever. However, if they see, oh, Final Fantasy, or oh, that, is that a Chocobo? Oh, Moogles. Hey, how wait, many what, people? What world is this? I mean, how many people? FF11 was their first MMO because it was a Final Fantasy game. Uh, that, well, that was me. me. Yeah. It wasn't my first MMO, no. but I mean, it, it, you know, like it's the first one I played seriously. I, like it actually, it dude, it nailed me on a conceptual level, on a conceptual level, because I was already playing Ultima Online. I had recently picked up Dark Age Camelot and was kind of enjoying it, but not totally. And I wanted something that I could really invest in. And here it here it was. It was online, and it had the Final Fantasy brand name, and there was a class in there called Dark Knight. Fuck it. I am in for this. <laughs> I went next door and saw Kyle running around on a Chocobo in Ron 4, and I was like, I'm sold on this game. I have to sit down and play this. And then I was super confused when I learned that they're like, wait, there's more zones inside of Ron 4? It's so big. What are you talking about? And then like, hey, you're adorable. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, that was weird though. Like, like the just size of the game was massive for someone who'd never played an MMO before. Well, and now, now I think, I think it's so hard to surprise an audience with an MMO these days. What are you? What can you really show them that they haven't seen before? Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, MMO audiences are very much a "what have you done for me lately" sort of crowd, and they're fickle. They're willing to they're willing to ditch an MMO subscription if they don't think it's worth the money. And that's the other thing about MMO subscriptions. You know, we were talking earlier about how if a game is free, it pushes your expectation level down. Yep. At the same time, if I'm paying a $60 price tag for your software and paying $12 a month to be able to have access to your game, my expectation level peaks. I mean, it really, like, it rises dramatically. And I think that's why you end up seeing the amount of criticism for FF14. And why I'm so willing to be open with my criticism about it is because, dude, you're getting my 12 bucks every month. You got my 60 bucks, and then uh, you got my 60 bucks for 1.0, you got my 60 bucks for 2.0, and you got my 40 bucks for Heaven's Word. I'm, I'm, I'm already in this. 160 bucks. Yeah. Before our subscriptions. Wait. You had to buy 2.0? Uh well, no, what, I think legacy players got it for free. You're right. Yeah, yeah. 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 you're right. Yeah, yeah, you got it. But if you didn't have the collector's edition and you wanted it, you could upgrade. Yeah, well, you had that's upgrade. right. Well, I've got a console. Got to get. I, it. I paid that that fee. Got to get I paid it for that, console. That fairy. Put my token in for that toll. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. if. if it, it's it's the amount of money that I've given to Square Enix already. And then to and then to have disappointing content on top of it. That's why I'm so willing to say this isn't good enough. Well, that's it's not it's not it doesn't come from a personal place, but it comes from a place of investment. Well, that's like you look at something like League, where there it costs zero to buy the game or to get the game. You can just sit down, and start playing immediately, and if you don't like a piece of content, you can just flat out ignore it. You don't ever have to get it, pay for it, whatever. Right. If you there's something, but that's where like I see, people say like, how can you buy a skin for a champion? I'm like, um, it's a champion I love, and the I skin looks really cool, and it's five bucks. Yeah, because give me because I don't have to pay for any other part of this game. Right. I, you know, it's it's like I the amount of money that I spent on Pokemon Go, I was able to justify to myself because I'm like, you know what, I'm not spending it on. Something else, you know what I mean? Well, like, you're, yeah, you didn't pay for the game to get it, and you look at it, you say, "I'm enjoying this. Yeah, I want to do more of exactly. it. I'm willing to pay for the entertainment." Right. Yeah. Right. And it's and and I mean, there's definitely a cost benefit analysis that everyone does. You know, and they look at the game that they're playing, whether it's Record Keeper, Pokemon Go, or League of Legends, or Final Fantasy XI, and they look at the amount that they're having to invest to play this game. Whether it's for access to the servers or whether it's through some limiting factor like Pokeballs, okay? They look, they do a cost-benefit analysis and go, all right, this is worth it or it's not. Everyone does that. Whether they know they do it or not, I think every single one of us does that. And that's how you end up with disengagement. That's how you end up with a frustrated player base. I mean, look at Deus Ex. Deus Ex... You can play that game without any of the microtransactions. That's how they that's how they developed it. 
They they were very specific. But Square Enix, being the company that they are, wanting the profits that they do, decided to shoehorn a microtransaction system in there at the last minute that fucks with the balance of the game. It's not often that Square Enix does something like that. Yeah, not not their... But they've been moving more and more and more and more in that direction. And that bothers me. That bothers me. That says to me that they don't have a clear direction for what they want out of their games. They just want the bottom line, which is the money. And they're willing to sacrifice the quality of a title to be able to go after it. That is unfortunate. And I don't think that that bodes terribly well for the future of their MMO products or for the future of just their single-player games. Yeah, I, I've i always been of the opinion, do one or the other, don't do both. I don't mind if you want to have a subscription model to your game, but if that's what it is, like, fine, you have a sub-model, go with that. Don't do both. Yeah. If you want to do a free-to-play model and you want to microtransact the shit out of your game, you go ahead. And, but do it right. Yeah. Do it the way that, you know, League of Legends is one where I look at their business model and I go, yeah, okay, that's, I get it. Yeah, I understand can, it. You can unlock other champions by playing the game. The only thing you actually have to pay for is aesthetics. Right. A, a, a lot of, I mean, the, and and a lot of games are starting to figure out that balance. Mm-hmm. I mean, because it is a, it is a very delicate balance that you're riding there. Yep. And what is at the heart of that? Some, it's it's been a big chorus on our shows for a long time. Player motivation, the developer knowing what the motivation of the player is, and exploiting that. And making the uh, making the audience, making the player feel like they need to stay engaged. That that's a very real thing that happens. I've 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 watched it happen inside of me. The will to stay engaged in a game is not endless. It is finite. And as soon as we look at that cost benefit analysis and go, my attention, my time, or my money is better spent doing something else, you've lost that person. And and for you know, for MMOs, your subscription in a lot of ways is your lifeblood. Your 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 audience. I, I should I should amend that. Your because there's only four games that that's applicable to. <laughs> your audience is your lifeblood. The people who are logging into your server and creating that world that you want to be so vibrant it requires that engagement and so it should be the developer's primary goal to be is asking themselves what do we need to do to drive that engagement through the roof it's got to be it's i mean because if not you end up with a completely ubiquitous game that never feels satisfying yeah uh, and like that's the hundred thousand dollar question: is what can you do to keep your player base motivated? Yeah, totally. MMOs have got to have got to ask this question more than other games, and I feel like other genres are succeeding and pulling it off. That balance between motivation and investment. They're they're riding that line a lot better and a lot in a lot smarter ways than MMO developers have done probably in the last ten years. That's the problem is other games become more capable of providing what an MMO can provide within their own uh, architecture. Right. That hill to climb for MMO games gets steeper and steeper and steeper until eventually they can't. Yeah. That day will come, and I think probably in the next five years in that area. So do all MMOs just go free to play? In five years, I would guess yes, if I had to take a guess. And we see no new MMOs, and we just slowly whittle away the genre? I think we still... I think what we define as an MMO will change. Think? I think it's what's going to happen. Okay. We will still have what we call MMOs, but they will be different than... We'll have new era MMOs. Like, we still have Limit Break Radio, but it's noticeably different. Well, okay. I mean, but I mean, haven't we already seen some of that shift between you know this first generation of MMOs and then... Uh, the infinite WoW clones that have come out in Absolutely. the wake of WoW. And I think we'll see another shift like that, even further away from I, what an MMO was. Well, I, I, my hope for the genre is that it doesn't just die this weird death, or that it doesn't just meet this you know, nebulous transformation like you're talking about, Callie. But I'd like to see it 
evolve. I'd like to see developers figure out a way to create a game environment that you can't replicate offline, that you can't replicate with a single player experience. A world that feels alive enough and inhabited enough on a regular enough basis to keep people plugged in. And I don't think that the traditional ways that they've tried to do that with either narrative engagement or with reward engagement is going to do it. It's going to take someone thinking outside the box and it's going to go have to go back to these very experiential uh you know this this sort of experiential core of gameplay because what was amazing about MMOs when I when I was young and first exploring them as a genre was much the same that comes out of Pokemon Go. It's the stories that you're sharing with other people and the epic tales that you're able to tell long after the adventure is done. But that, that still comes down to MMOs at the time could provide something that other games couldn't. Yes. And I don't know... As other game systems and other t genres of games are advancing at a ridiculous pace. I don't... That, that gap has shrunk to nothing. I don't know I don't what disagree. MMOs could possibly I do. I don't disagree, but it's going to take one of them thinking outside the box in kind of the same way that Niantic had and and making a radical decision, much like Niantic did, by said, all right, we're taking the D-pad out of this. you got to walk to find your shit. That's a revolutionary idea. Yeah. No matter what way you cut it, for in terms of gameplay and game mechanics, that is just that is a totally new concept that has never been successful in this industry. And Niantic and Pokemon Go made that successful. So it's going to take a, a developer doing that with the medium of MMOs and, st and not looking at it like as a, as a genre or like these are the tro You know, it has to be a hot bar MMO. It, it, it's going to take somebody coming in and breaking convention yeah. for something new to come out. And, and maybe you're right. Maybe it won't look as much like an MMO. But those conventions that WoW has established and a lot of these other very successful MMOs have established, that's the first thing that needs to be thrown out and pitched and say in favor of something that is more engaging. But that's what I mean when we see we will see a massive shift in what sure. an MMO looks like. We will move away from that. Yeah. MMOs as they currently are are not sustainable. Yeah. I don't believe that. Yeah. And within five years, I think they'll be gone. Yeah. So who's who's the next uh, game to switch off of a subscription model? Do you think? Fourteen. You think? No. I mean, they're no. already looking at jumping potions. <laughs> God damn. I would see WoW do it before fourteen. No. Yeah, I, I was, yeah. No. Yeah. No. Wow. Wow's the last holdout because they've got all the money. They have all the subs and they have all. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. They there's can, there's no way you don't see WoW being the ones that are say like, look, we got tons of people who will play this game no matter what. No. Wow. Why would they throw away all that money? Because yeah. people are going to pay that money no matter what because I have all these mounts and all these achievements. Well, that but that's also making the assumption that you would make less money on a different system. You think you think League of Legends is making any shortage of money? They make money hand over fist on their system. Yeah, but while also has their cash shop. I mean, they make money hand over fist with that. Yeah, it's it's I mean, it, I think it only really becomes a solution when you're hemorrhaging money, when when money is the problem. Hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, l like I said, Dark Age Camelot and Ultima Online, still subscription models, which means that they've got to be at least somewhat in the black. Oh, yeah. They can't be in the red. They can't yeah. be operating that game in the red. No way. Well, no, Someone would no. come in and pull the plug. Yeah, there's a lot of people who play Dayok. A lot. Really? Well, yeah. It's, no it's either going to be 14 or WoW. Hmm. I don't see it being Dayok, and I don't see it being Ultima Online. There's no reason for them to. Ultima Online has the same issue as Eleven. It's too old to be worth developing a microtrans system for. I think I think the one that is at most risk of falling is FF14 because yeah. it's really only a, uh, you know, it's it's really only a, an opinion that, it, you know, it, that game could be a freemium game. It could change very easily, but there's just one guy who's. It seems like there's just one guy who's blocking, and that's Yoshi. Yeah, I say 14 will never do it as long as Yoshi's there. The day we see Yoshi get let go off the project, then maybe. I don't know about that. You think Yoshi would ever allow that game to go free to play? I think Yoshi will do whatever Square Enix corporate says he has to do. Yeah, 
I mean, I think Square Enix corporate gives them a lot of leeway. But yes. I think if they said, hey, this is going to happen, free to play now. Yeah. His hands are tied. You do it? Uh, it you, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, dude, Tanaka, Tanaka had his hands tied with what was done to yeah. FF14 1.0 underneath him. They said, you have a deadline that you have to meet, and fuck you if you don't meet it. And he didn't. They did. Yeah, he they didn't. fucked him. He didn't, and and who yep. who bore the brunt of that responsibility? Tanaka was given a window mm-hmm. seat for six months before he was drummed out of that company, yep. and he's never been the same person since. Now, remember, Tanaka was on the original development team for the original Final Fantasy game. That was, I mean, the drive, the creative drivers behind the original Final Fantasy game were Tanaka, Uimatsu. And Sakaguchi, yeah, as, as close to an untouchable as you could possibly. He was see. pretty much, you know, yes, and his and and he was credited with the success of Eleven, which floated the company for something like six years. Yep. And even still, they gave that guy a deadline, held him to it. He fucked it up, and they let him go. You don't think that Yoshi P is just riding by the skin of his teeth? He's just riding on the success. That's it. He could easily be given the same fate mm-hmm. as Gunpei Yokoi and be given the window seat in the company. It it could absolutely fucking happen. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, like we want to credit him with all of these with all of this stuff, but I mean, Square Enix is letting him make those decisions. Mm. I don't know what kind of clout you need to pull to have that. But there are very few people that have that anymore. Uh yeah, I'd say there's next to no one. Very, very few. Because what happens, you know, you you get a great game, uh, like uh, you know, like one of those one of the call the modern warfare's yeah. right where you still had the original, uh, the original development team, and then you know Infinity Ward, and then Modern Warfare or Modern Warfare Two comes out. I can't remember what it was, and then you had a busting up of the company. All the talent yeah. left because of internal problems. Infinity Ward is still a company. They still make games. But none of the original team. None of the original talent is there. Yep. You're right. It's sort of the same thing. And 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 there are very few people who carry that name recognition that still have respect. Hideo Kojima is one of them. I mean, it used to be Peter Molyneux was one. He lost all of his respect. I mean, it's a very I mean, this is a very fickle industry. Yeah. Even if you are an auteur, even if you do have a name for yourself, it's not a lock. Yeah, it, it is a fickle industry. I mean, the upside to that is you can be in the dumps and make a good game and you're right back in everyone's good graces well it's the same thing about gambling you yeah. play one good hand and you're right back in the game That's buddy true. except uh no one will ever give you that second hand that, if, you, if you fuck up true. once then a lot why, of times you're should, done why should i trust you as a developer i'm not going to trust your leadership you failed once is that do you think that that's true inside the industry inside the companies that we're talking about or are you talking about with the audience you fuck up once with the audience and no. the audience is gone no i mean someone who had like like a company be, being able to like fund your idea or whatever right yeah. so so square enix views yoshi p fucking up as once and that's it but the audience i, I mean do, 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 does the audience have that same power if if you fuck up with the audience, I feel like you're given a lot of chances. Still, someone can. Yeah. Fa- you, oh, yeah. There have been yeah. people in this industry who have failed upwards. That is a thing. That's very real. I, I mean, it's happened. So you know, if that's if if that's possible as a dev releasing shitty games, I, I mean, you're not wrong. You're not wrong that that you know, like there are companies who will drum perfectly talented people out because they feel like they made some bad decisions right but how often is that honestly connected to to game sales i mean uh, what's what's the one guy what is that guy who made psychonauts and the uh, the jack black metal game that i can't remember oh uh, pick a destiny is it um jaffy brutal legend, right? is that jaffy did jaffy do brutal legend i don't remember Look up who, uh, Chris. Look up who did Brutal Legend. Thank you. Who made Brutal Legend? Yes, thank you. Uh, John Carmack. John, uh, is that it? No, no. So okay. He did Daikatana. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm just hearing names like oh yes, yeah. right. Double, Double Fine Do- Productions. Double Fine. Double Fine. No, who's who's behind? Who's the Tim Schafer? Tim Schafer. Schafer thank thank you. you. Fuck. I could not remember the name. Monkey Island, right? Tim Schafer. Yeah. yeah. He did Monkey Island. But yeah. Tim, but Tim Schafer 
What is he? Do- I mean, look, Psychonauts is a great game. Pick a Destiny, not so much. But <laughs> pick my nose. Uh, Psychonauts is a fantastic game, but he's released, I don't know, a bunch of very commercially unsuccessful games, but yet nobody goes well. They they don't. No, no one ever puts him in the same category as Peter Molyneux, right? I think Tim Schafer lied a lot less. Yeah. Peter Molyneux didn't do himself any favors. No, uh, that's true. That's true. I mean, you know, last week we were talking about uh, the No Man's Sky no Man's development Sky, yeah. and, and Hello Games and Sean Murray and all of that stuff. But, I, I, like, at what point do you damage your, your credibility with the audience so much that you can't even pull it back either? So you can damage your credibility with the developer for sure, but... John Romero. I mean, yes, John Romero. There's, I mean, there's a great example. There are plenty of really good examples of people who have been able to... But And the thing is that they fail with the audience, but they still get shots at making games for some reason. <laughs> that's the part yeah. that I don't understand. That's when I, when I said people are allowed to fail upward. That's what I meant, is that they put out a game, it doesn't do well, and then... Somebody goes, yeah, put out another one. Eh, try again. That happens. That kind of happens with alarming regularity. Hmm. You know it what? Sure it does. It's, I mean, it, it happens a lot more with NA companies. Oh uh, yeah. Well, it happens. Uh, fuck. It happens so much with the movie industry. Oh yeah. Oh my god. Hmm. It's egregious with the mu- with the movie industry. At least there does seem like there is some kind of check and balance with the with the games industry. Maybe that has something to do with like. <laughs> Like Americans as uh, a culture, we are obsessed with the comeback story, maybe, and things like that. The uh, underdog, the underdog, or the yeah. comeback story. Like maybe that's what it is. That's maybe. why NA companies are more open to it. I don't know. No, fuck that. Maybe we're just, just, we're just selling stupid, it well. or we're stupid. That's what it is. is we're Could stupid. Oh, it's the new biggest thing from Michael Bay. I know it's gonna be garbage, but I gotta go see it. I gotta see how garbage it is. <laughs> why are you looking at me? What do you want? I've never seen a Transformers movie. Yeah, but you see Michael Bay movies. What was just filmed? What did he make area? recently? It doesn't matter. What Michael Bay movie? Uh, next Transformers. Oh, this yeah. is filmed right down the road from me. Oh, uh, it's it's also being filmed downtown too. I think the last Michael Bay movie I saw was Pearl Harbor, and it was garbage. Ugh. I saw oh, the that Rock. Wasn't bad. That was that was that's the only that's the only movie of his I've ever seen. The Rock. The Rock. It's our Sean, 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 Connery. Sean Connery. Oh, that's right. Okay. Dude gets dude gets impaled on a on a uh, warhead at the end with the the green bead things that blow up with uh, chemicals. Was that was that part of the rock? Wasn't it? I don't remember. And then uh, what's this? Am I talking about the different movie? I have no idea. Uh, I think Juxta smells what the rock's cooking. <laughs> what's that one guy with the uh, Nicholas Cage just to stab himself in the heart? Okay, that's sounding a little bit more familiar. Yeah. I still can't believe they took my face off and face off. <laughs> right. Oh man! But yeah, there there is that ability to fail upwards in this industry, and that I think is frustrating. People who are continually given a big platform and a lot of money to put out crap. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. It's unfortunate. Um, all right, so I think that that sort of wraps up our discussion here. MMO of, of Michael Bay movies of Michael Bay movies. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I just, I, I think, I think you guys are right. I think that w- there is a conceivable point in the future where MMOs are just no longer a thing. Yep, I'm calling it about five years. That'd I think that's sad. about where we're at. Mm-hmm. I, I, it will be sad because MMOs have been big part of my life. You know, like I love the genre. I think the genre is great. And the interaction with other people is perfect. It's, it's it's what I want out of gaming. But I think we'll see that interaction step up so much more in other genres of sure. gaming that it won't be unique to MMOs. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. Hopefully, though, there will always be a place for MMOs. I'm looking forward to AR World of Warcraft. If if for if nothing AR MMOs. If nothing else, if nothing else, we know that Blizzard will keep WoW running forever. <laughs> Yeah. We'll always have WoW. Great. And that's a comforting thought. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. That's going to do it here for the show. Appreciate you joining us here for Final Encountercast. Twitch.tv slash Final Encountercast. Hit that follow button. Join us live each and every single Sunday starting at 5 p.m. here on Twitch.tv slash Final Encountercast. Join the discussion. Hang out in our chat room. Call the show. We like to interact with you guys. Uh, FinalEncounterCast.com is the website. You can check out past shows there. Subscribe to the podcast. 
Leave us some iTunes love. That's over on Final Encounter Cast. You could search the iTunes Marketplace to find that. We would appreciate it. If you did, it would help a, a bunch of other people find this show. And the thing that we want to do is we want this community to keep growing. You know, we do a pretty good job at the FF14 community growth, but we need to do a better job over here on, F, on uh, FEC. Uh, so we would like to uh, encourage more people to listen and subscribe, and that you can actually help help out a lot with uh, by going to iTunes, search Final Encounter Cast, leave us a little bit of love on iTunes. That's going to be it for the show, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, again, we are super excited to be working on this new project and hope that you can't wait to hear it because we can't wait to play it for you when we do get the chance to play it for you. Uh, thanks for uh, checking out our eSports update. And uh, yeah, we, we hope that uh, you'll end up liking the new show that we have in the works. I want to thank my crew. Of course, we got Len over here hanging out, filling in for Robbie. Uh, Kuki has been off this week. We have... Chris over here with a K. No, <laughs> with a C H. Who's been manning the? Who's been manning the drops? P H. And the phones. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. With a K. We've also got Nika, who's been hanging out on Skype. Thank you, Nika. Yep. And of course, as every week, we have Callie over at the news desk. Also with a K. Also with a K. <laughs> Callie. Just, with a just C. so everyone That's is. Callie with a C. That's right. There is, I know people that spell it that. Had Callie at the news desk showing off our brand new segment. Thank you, Callie. Callie. Pre appreciate your hard work. Yes. That's going to do it here for Final Encounter Cast. Guys, again, FinalEncounterCast.com to find us on the web. I'm Nate. Have a good one.